Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii, streaming live every Tuesday at noon from the Think Tech studio in downtown Honolulu. With the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative launched in 2008, the private sector and state government laid the foundation for what are today the most ambitious energy goals in the nation, including 100% renewable energy for electricity by 2045. But we've lagged behind in setting a similar goal for the transportation sector. My guest today is taking up the charge to help bring the transportation sector into alignment with a focus on renewable fuels in Hawaii. Joelle Simon Pietri is Program Manager for Energy Research at the University of Hawaii's Applied Research Laboratory. She was formerly on detail to PACOM from the University of Hawaii's Natural Energy Institute. She co-led the Green Initiative for Fuels Transition, otherwise known as GIFPAC, their biofuels supply chain program with the U.S. Navy. And she led the Joint Deployment Energy Planning and Logistics Optimization Initiatives for the U.S. Department of Defense. Joelle started her career as a U.S. Naval officer in the Asia Pacific region. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Neurobiology from Duke University and a Master's in Business Administration in Private Equity and Renewable Energy from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Wow, Joelle, welcome to the show. I, I think Thank you're you. more than fully qualified to talk about today's subject. <laughs> uh, well, more importantly, I find it fun. So Terrific. Well, that, that's certainly what makes it a success yeah. in our community. And you've been on Think Tech many times, so we often draw on your expertise to inform our audience. Okay. Today, tell us a little bit about our Hawaii's transportation goals and you know, where we headed and do we have one? Um, well, transportation-wise, as far as a clean energy goal, um, what we have is a fair number of stakeholders are interested in potentially setting a goal. Um, and so one of your colleagues, Carl Campagna, is uh, uh, working on a similar think tech series focused on biofuels this month. Um, yeah, it's been very informative. I, I encourage our audience to tune in. But uh, there isn't a goal per se um, at this time. and so. Uh, part of the debate is about whether or not it makes sense to try and set a goal for transportation uh, as has been done for electricity because uh, in electricity what you have is a regulated market with a, um, a much smaller number of players. Um, so one of the things that I um, brought some stuff to talk about today is actually a non-regulatory approach to setting transportation goals. And so I was going to walk through... I know a lot of people are going to be very happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to walk through some international and national examples of a voluntary industry principles, um, largely by the commercial aviation industry. Well, that's terrific because that accounts for a third of our energy uh, consumption in Hawaii, right? That's right. And it's much larger here because of the distance, um, uh, sheer distance from the, um, from the coasts on either side of the Pacific Ocean. And um, so uh, air transportation is a much more intense uh, part of, of the uh, energy consumption in the state of Hawaii, about a third. And then ground transportation is another third. So um, what uh, is showing on the screen right now is a um, graphic that shows the relative um, carbon life cycle emissions um, for the different modes of transportation. This is uh, European data. Um, they actually just had the, um, <laughs> the cleanest graphic that I was able to find on short notice uh, to be able to display here. But it's, um, it's going to be roughly representative for other major um, developed markets like the U.S. So what you see up top is um, the purple. That's actually aviation. So relative to 1990, um, uh, emissions have gone, went up over time up to about uh, through 1999 and then 2008. Um, that's actually more because of greater demand, and it's much more dependent actually on economic cycles than on technical advancements or underlying greenhouse gas emissions. What you had in 1999 and 2005, 2006 was economic booms where people had a lot more disposable income and were able to get on the plane a lot more often. But now, I also understand from CAFE's promotional materials anyway from the uh, aviation Association. Mm -hmm. What does CAFI stand for again? Oh, CAFI stands for the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuel Initiative. Right. 
<laughs> so Kathy's um, promotional materials talk about how they have become more efficient while they're also looking at new fuels. So is that uh, curve also representative when it goes down of some of their efforts at being more efficient? Um, that's actually what can show uh, future tense in the next. So if okay. you want to just go ahead and move on to that. So this is where we get to the voluntary principles. So mm -hmm. the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, and all of its member airlines, that includes all the U.S. airlines, uh, and the U.S. Um, aviation Organization, which is now called A4A, or Airlines for America, have also signed on to this. So this is basically the aviation industry's plan to improve its carbon intensity for air transportation starting in 2010 um, and then going out to 2050. So starting from the top, that basically that top line, you know, the blue um, that's sort of marching up is is the forecasted emissions growth based on growth in demand and just based on growth in population mm -hmm. worldwide um, without, if no action is taken to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's what uh, you're looking at on the top blue line. And then to start to chip away at that, the first strategy is ongoing fleet renewal and technology development. So that's the answer to the most frequently asked question I get um, about, um, uh, about aviation and sustainability is what about efficiency? Mm -hmm. So that's what that blue sector is talking about. That's things like adding winglets. So the next time you fly into or out of Honolulu Airport, take a look at the wing of your aircraft and if it's got a little point sticking up out in the sides, um, that's a winglet. That can actually improve the fuel efficiency by up to 2%. And that's different than the flaps that we've seen over the years that, are, that, that go up when we're landing? Yes. Okay. Yes. They're, they're, um, they are stationary. But what they do is they actually reduce the drag on the wingtip. Um, and it was actually developed from a uh, biology study. So it was developed actually from studying um, very efficient large birds. What large birds will do when they're coasting is actually point their little wing, their wingtip feathers up. And so um, uh, Boeing and Airbus uh, and you know international civil aviation organizations did a bunch of modeling and simulation with universities like the Georgia Institute for Technology and actually discovered that that could have significant fuel savings for oh, fascinating uh, for narrow or wide body aircraft so um, so that's kind of a no-brainer other aspects of aviation fuel efficiency um, can I in that in that blue bar also are going to include some new uh, fuel efficient engines and so I got uh, an opportunity uh, almost a year ago to actually see the first Boeing 737 MAX being born. Um, that's a projected to have 12% greater fuel efficiency compared to um, its most current 737 prior to that. And a big part of it is just because it's a much larger engine with a larger air intake. So um, it's actually going to require some interesting changes on in how airport operations work. Well, that's uh, counterintuitive. One would think a larger engine would require more energy. That's exactly why it was such a, you know, you get these interesting serendipities when you start actually really doing some detailed engineering on, uh, on, on aviation and fuel efficiency. So, and when you do bi biomimicry. <laughs> because obviously the birds have had this down for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have. Um, so, uh, you know, so going back to that graphic, as you sort of march down, there's other, um, uh, other strategies in there. So um, uh, next is ATC stands for air traffic control. So mm -hmm. the next plan to get, you know, the next chunk of uh, reduction in carbon life cycle emissions is actually through operational improvements, better mm -hmm. routes, better landing patterns, better takeoff patterns, better circulating patterns around airports, uh, and rolling out the next generation air traffic control system, which will be much smarter uh, and more real time. And then, um, that big green chunk, um, you know, basically the balance of the uh, trying to keep carbon life cycle emissions at the baseline despite actual growth and demand and even cut into it so that at 2050 they're aiming to be 20% below um, 1990 levels. That mm -hmm. is actually going to come from low carbon fuels hmm. or uh, biofuels right. in short. So that really is where you're focusing your efforts is in greening the fleet of aviation. You've been involved for years in greening the naval fleet with gift pack with the Green Initiative for Transportation Fuels for the military. 
um, you're covering it all. Well, it's all related. The, um, uh, the Department of Defense is a member of the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuel Initiative. Uh, and um, the Department of Defense and uh, commercial airlines in the U.S. signed a memorandum agreeing to collaborate on alternative fuel research, testing, certification, and procurement. And so um, that co-purchasing is uh, part of the reason why, you know, I worked on this from the Department of Defense side, but I'm here today talking about the commercial aviation side. The jet fuel is actually the same. So, and, Absolutely. and uh, one of the decisions that was made early on is, is that modification of aircraft it really isn't realistically going to happen for another 40 or 50 years just because of the service life of air, an aircraft that rolls off the production line today is going to have a service life of 40 years. And so if you're going to try and green the, um, green the fuel, then doing it by aircraft modification is tackled than that other strategy we already talked about. Doing it in the fuel um, requires modifying how you actually produce the fuel. Well, and I'm sure that the federal government is very involved because we've set national targets, and that's important for the government to push and lead with, but also the costs need to be uh, somehow absorbed for the advanced research and, and the technology, right? So we need federal dollars in that, or are we coming close to commercial uh, viability for the cost of jet fuel, renewable jet fuel? Well, there's, um, there's a fair amount of federal uh, research dollars and, you know, we can talk about sort of the different points of the technology maturation cycle. So there's some federal research dollars, certainly. They're actually dwarfed by the private sector investment mm -hmm. over time. So over the past decade, uh, I think the most recent set of numbers I got is uh, about an eight to one for every one dollar um, in federal uh, taxpayer dollars that was invested in R&D or technology development or maturation, eight dollars in private sector funding. Uh, well, that's terrific applied. to hear, and I assume that's because the private sector really is forecasting into the future and seeing how they need to survive in order to do that. They need to be on the cutting edge with renewable fuels. Is that because of regulation or because they're actually improving their bottom line now by switching? Well, um, part of the reason why the commercial aviation industry is still focused on fuels now, even with fuel prices as low as they have been for the past two to three years, is because 2006 to 2008 was a wake-up call. Uh, we had several airlines serving Hawaii that went bankrupt during that time. Aloha Airlines was one, ATA was another. and. Um, and so the commercial airlines, to their credit, have realized that this is an existential issue for industries that are very dependent on fuel, like aviation is. And so they have not slacked at all the pressure or desire to develop alternative and greener sources for, uh, for operational fuels. And so well, they're just as enthusiastic today as they were when oil was $147 a barrel. So after the break, we're going to have to take a little break, I want to ask you then, is it necessary to incentivize this? Perhaps not. And that's very different from the ground transportation arena we've been looking at for years. So we'll be right back with Joelle, who's going to answer those questions. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Hi, we're back with Sustainable Hawaii and our guest, Joel Simon Pietri, who is giving us a primer on why the aviation industry is uh, so much more uh, out there in trying to transition to more alternative fuels than my experience has been over my lifetime with the ground transportation industry. 
Why is that? Well, we talked about some of the business incentives before the break. Um, you know, during uh, you know, the 2005, 2006, 2007, when fuel prices were high, for the first time um, since the 1970s, um, fuel prices were actually a larger proportion of a commercial airline's cost than labor. So mm -hmm. it was the first time that fuel actually cost more than labor. Mm -hmm. And um, that was also part of the wake-up call. So part of the reason why there's this sustained pressure. But also, um, for a lot of the airlines, you know, it's how they incentivize their employees. It's how they want to try and compete in a more, um, you know, forward-thinking marketplace. And so for some airlines, like Alaska Airlines, it's part of how they try and actually position themselves competitively. They honestly do try and actually be um, more sustainable across the board in how they do operations. So more efficient, um, uh, more um, uh, first mover as, as far as signing agreements in Hawaii for mm -hmm. biofuel supplies. And uh, it's part of how they want to position themselves market-wise as well. Um, you had another question before the break. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you about positioning yeah. themselves in Hawaii. So yeah. some of those market agreements, mm -hmm. um, tell us about, you know, who you just mentioned Alaska Airlines. What is that agreement and who else is getting on board and what can we expect to see? I know that you're on the advisory mm -hmm. committee um, for uh, CAFI and you're also convening the strategic sustainability plan, <laughs> right, for uh, a couple groups. Explain us. Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, uh, well, um, CAFI, uh, the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuel Initiative. So this is a U.S. national initiative. It was actually started by the Federal Aviation Administration. And um, uh, CAFI is a public-private partnership. So the federal entities that are involved are the Federal Aviation Administration, the Department of Energy, Department of Defense. Um, and on the industry side, um, there, there's over 200 members, uh, member um, entities. So uh, CAFI also basically has all of the major equipment origin manufacturers. So Boeing and Airbus and General Electric and Pratt and Whitney, um, Rolls Royce. Those are basically aviation um, engine suppliers. The examples that I'm giving, and then all the commercial airlines as well. So Delta, and United and Alaska, um, and uh, our members, um, largely through the airline um, industry association called A4A Airlines for America. So getting to the sustainability. So CAFI is focused on um, greening the fuels and biofuels, but has some sustainability goals within that. Yes, it's okay, keep this up. Uh, sustainability goals within that as far as environmental goals for CAFI. Um, the overall objectives for alternative fuel deployment are to come up with competitively priced um, market-based renewable fuel supply chains um, uh, that can compete against petroleum, but also um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve some other environmental benefits. One thing that's uh, very important to the FAA and to uh, commercial airlines is some other sustainability aspects that aren't necessarily transparent to the average traveling public. So there's a lot of emphasis on noise reduction. So aircraft today are significantly quieter compared to an aircraft that would have been, you know, flying into or departing from Honolulu Air Airlines, uh, Honolulu Airport in 1970, as an example. There's also a lot of emphasis on particulate matter reduction, both on the ground um, with the ground support equipment and when air aircraft are getting started up on the ground, but also at altitude because particulate matter at altitude is known to have greenhouse gas um, or greenhouse effects. I'm sure so. just for us common folk to understand, it travels on the airways, right, and on the air currents and affects other places as much as wherever they happen to emit them, right? So if you remember, uh, depending on how old you are, back when you were a child and you used to look up the sky and you would see, you know, twin white contrails right. um, of aircraft, you know, flying overhead, and you don't see those anymore. Oh. That's actually because of these emissions reductions in particulate matter. Those contrails were actually formed by basically the tiny bits of smoke, not, not smoke, but particulate matter coming out of the engines. Well, that's and so they know. would cause condensation in the upper atmosphere. Um, 
I'm not a physicist. I might have used the wrong part of the atmosphere just now, but <laughs> <laughs> bear with me. So, but that's actually why you don't see contrails um, from, from modern aircraft uh, nearly as often today. Well, terrific. So. Tell me, um, within the, the strategic sustainability mm -hmm. approach for Hawaii, and I believe it also includes the tropics and subtropics, mm -hmm. what are the goals and how are those going to help lead or not the transportation goals for Hawaii with regard to aviation? Well, goal-wise, um, uh, GIFPAC, when it was established, um, set three goals, which is um, you know, technically acceptable fuel. It has to be chemically equivalent to jet fuel um, that the military would use today or that commercial airlines would use today. Um, uh, produced in a um, produced in a manner that is sustainable in terms of you know labor, environmental impact, um, and then. Uh, the, the third aspect of it is actually ongoing business sustainability from suppliers that end up having strong enough balance sheets to be able to weather economic ups and downs and to have multiple parties in an actual healthy market. So rather than um, trying to put all eggs in one basket, one supply chain, or one particular player, uh, GiftPack has been focused on trying to, uh, trying to encourage a healthy, um, competitive um, market with multiple players. Well, certainly that's the role of government material. because we don't want government ever to replace the private sector. <laughs> so they're actually encouraging it. Yeah. And and GiftPack has been uh, very visible in the past, at least um, in the Hawaii scenario with regard to the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative and being part of Verge. Um, how are how are they leading us? for the transportation goals for Hawaii and who's involved with that? Okay, well, um, GIFPAC is, uh, we've kind of morphed GIFPAC over time. It now looks a lot more like a Hawaii chapter of CAFE. Mm -hmm. um, so has uh, airlines participating. Um, it has a lot of local stakeholders um, focused on the supply chain side. So everything from landowners and feedstock producers to, you know, farmers, um, uh, to transportation of intermediates and um, end consumers uh, as, and refiners in the middle. So try and actually have at least one representative from each point in the supply chain. Um, and if you wanted to bring up a backup image, I could show, you know, uh, I could show um, uh, there's sort of a, a picture, picture version of a supply chain from left Absolutely, to right. Absolutely, that would be very um, informative. But Zuri will have to find it because I didn't number it on the... <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm leading us all over the world here. Um, well, with regard to the, the supply chain, mm -hmm. um, I know that there, we, you're looking at all the different fuels and the different technologies. Um, with regard to aviation, what are some of those that we can expect to see be most successful? I know that there was, um, or several years ago, United Airlines tested uh, some cellulosic biofuels. I know that we've got a company now in Hawaii um, doing biofuels that are hydro-treated for aviation fuel as well. Tell me about that. Um, well, uh, Pacific Biodiesel um, is right now the only biofuel company in Hawaii that's producing commercial fuels. And uh, so I'll let, um, you know, let Bob King and, uh, you know, talk mm -hmm. for their company and their plans. I have been encouraging them to take a look at uh, upgrading their product to an aviation fuel. But there are incentive, incentive problems. And so it kind of goes back to your question before the break, where are incentives needed? The incentives are actually needed on the producer side because um, basically if you have a gallon of um, you know, used cooking oil, like, like a Pacific biodiesel does, or it's man, you know, mainland equivalent, what you can make from that is roughly a gallon of biodiesel or roughly a gallon of, um, or you can make a third of a gallon of jet fuel, a third of a gallon of diesel, and a third of a gallon of green gasoline out of that same gallon of used cooking oil. And so, um, that fraction of jet fuel, that fraction of diesel, and that fraction of gasoline right now at today's market prices don't actually earn as much for that one gallon of feedstock as selling it as biodiesel. Right. And the biodiesel right now is going into more ground transportation applications, 
right we need. Right, and mm -hmm. biodiesel is a perfectly, uh, perfectly good, perfectly acceptable fuel for ground transportation. So that's actually the where the incentives problem is, and part of the reason why the aviation industry has um, gotten together so regularly. So you talked about upcoming events. So yeah. uh, CAFE's national biennial meeting is going to be happening at the end of this month. That's going to be um, October 25th, 26th, 27th. And um, our local uh, gift pack Hawaii version of that um, will be having a, our next quarterly face-to-face uh, -face meeting actually um, on the North Shore and you're hosting it so maybe you <laughs> want to tell us a little bit. <laughs> well I know we're going to take a site visit, a field yeah. trip to the Altera Orchards yeah, so. and, and uh, that'll be very exciting. That's the company that I was thinking about in Hawaii. They're actually producing mm -hmm. some of the source material, right? right. Where are they manufacturing? Um, so what Terviva is doing is Terviva, growing Pong, is growing Pongamia, and if you check out Carl Campagna's show from last Wednesday, actually, he actually had a speaker from Terviva um, oh, who talked about their crops. What we're going to get to see at the next Gift Pack Hawaii meeting is actually go get to um, all the members. It's a it's an open meeting, uh, and you know. Um, they're well, you know, anybody is welcome to come if they're keenly interested in biofuels production and deployment. And that's on November second, <laughs> 9 a.m. at Camp Mokulaia. Yes. To, to, to give the North Shore their fair due. Exactly. Well, you have a couple other pictures I want to get up here in our last minute. Okay. Um, one is the KLM biofuel aircraft. Sure. So. Um, what I wanted to close with is, uh, I've talked a lot about future tents, but this is past tense. There have been over 1,400 biofuel-powered flights across the globe uh, to date. Um, and that number is actually a little bit old because it's two years ago. Uh, United Airlines has begun um, to have biofuel supply in all of its flights out of Los Angeles airport starting in January. And uh, there's a whole bunch, if you go to that Kathy website, there's a whole bunch of more recent announcements by different airlines. Um, Lufthansa, um, uh, there's uh, an actual a greening airport uh, initiative in Europe um, called, um, uh, I think it's like, it's at Schiphol Airport. Um, so and this is a view from Delta Flight 837? Right, yeah. So your my, my uncle took this. Um, it was his last flight before retiring. He's a, a Delta pilot trainer, and so he took this from the cockpit, which is rather unusual for those of us who are usually in the back of the aircraft. So Was he flying on renewable jet fuel by any <laughs> chance? Unfortunately, no. Oh. Delta uh, does not have a renewable fuel supplier. Well, yet. they're going to get it now. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Well, thank you, Joelle. We look forward to having you on again because, as usual, we only touch the surface. Mahalo, and please join us next Tuesday on Sustainable Hawaii at noon.